Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said to all Israel the words which the Lord commanded him. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. After the Gospel we just heard, what do we say but, well, sign me up! 
When we come to this scene in Luke's telling of the gospel, one might ask, how is this good news? There is something one would come to expect about joining a new movement, especially one that proposes something great is about to happen. But that's just it. Today and the good news as a whole is not meant to just simply comfort, let alone placate where or who we have been, and certainly not about self-congratulatory platitudes or trite phrases. This is not, I'm okay, you're okay, but something much more. Jesus is encountered here as much as a prophet as a rabbi, growing in popularity, but unlike the lyrics to the song from Wicked, this new life Jesus talks about and even demonstrates is not about being popular. It involves something of us if we are to take it on this new life and take it seriously. Even now, as we begin so many things in our life, a new school year, programs, perhaps new jobs, new relationships, we enter into these things carrying many things of a past. Oftentimes, still too many things. Now, some are physical, everyday items we need, but also we find things we carry in our thoughts and in our heart. Some of these are wonderful and helpful, but some may feel burdensome. We may feel obligated to carry things that no longer serve us necessarily, but we've always done it that way. So now, somehow, if we're honest, we feel a little stuck serving them instead of them serving us. Jesus confronts this sense of obligation and burden in our gospel passage from Luke. As we have been following the gospel according to Luke in these past weeks, we have heard Jesus talk about life in an entirely different way, a new way, more than a movement. He describes a whole new kingdom, a reality, the kingdom of God, a great new age of living that Jesus is here to establish. This new life is about living all together in different terms and priorities. Even our known relationships change in this new life with this new lens. Along the way, the conversation is turning to the implications or the ramifications of living into this new life. And this part is simply called by many people the cost of discipleship, the cost of following in this mission and being a disciple of Jesus. I have found these words of Jesus shared here in this passage from Luke. Yes, it feels startling, but I have come to know not just how penetrating and true, but also how incredibly empowering these are. How this came to be for me was not so much from a class in seminary or even from a mentor, but through a particular community I was asked to serve. I became well acquainted with a congregation that seemed to embody all of what is said in this passage so vividly. The life lessons here had a profound effect on me, not just as a young priest, but in my very own discipleship. You see, the little congregation I had had been described to me to come and serve among them as a vicar, to me was a congregation waiting for a fresh entrepreneurial leader, someone who could help them restart this mission of the diocese. And I saw myself as following the example of St. Francis and described to also rebuild God's church. Both views were naive. In actuality, the little congregation had a history that was already more than 20 years old. They had done what they, as a congregation, set out to do in their minds. They built a building. Now they were living the dream. So what was so wrong? What was going on? The congregation had come to embody what was described here in Luke. They were possessed. What was meant to serve them, they could now only see as the only thing they needed to serve. They loved what they had created, but were now too tired, too old to maintain, let alone build upon, And then came the bigger problem of clarity. What exactly were they tasked or called to build exactly? Simply put, the congregation was not willing to truly take on 
what was dearest to them, what they built themselves, and release it for God's direction, a new direction, a new way of being, a new way to serve the kingdom of people of God, new people itself coming in, desiring to know that kingdom. They could not see anything beyond the building. They were stuck. They were possessed. Jesus confronts this in our passage from Luke. But what words are are those? They sound so startling. What are we to make of Jesus' words? Are we really supposed to hate? Well, probably not in the way we're used to typically thinking. In its context, the translation here may not refer so much as to such a strong negative emotion, but rather uncompromising loyalty to something else. You see, to contrast what we serve or often call loving something, it was said that we hate the thing that is opposed. Perhaps the best way to see it is to ask, so what is it we ultimately trust, that we serve it above all other things? But Jesus talks about this kind of love, hate, especially with money, a seemingly favorite subject to discuss in the gospel. Here, Jesus is asking, in order to follow me with your whole self, what are you willing to let go of? What is that which possesses you that you trust so much you would keep from embracing this new life and this new way so that you would keep bound to that old life? What would come first above all else? Sometimes our hearts turn ever so slowly and modestly that we don't notice how far we have gone apart from the obvious of serving false gods and idols we build up in our minds. We can all too easily fall into a trap of serving our own cause or our business without remembering the goal in the first place. What it is we are trying to do and become. It can happen as it did with a whole community or congregation It can happen with people. It can happen with families. And even each of us, if we're willing to look at ourselves honestly, chances are you know someone who is living the dream they've described in their minds. They have done what they said they wanted to do or even felt they should do, and yet you can see that they are empty. Life just is not working. I wonder what is possessing them. As Jesus confronts the crowds with this unusual invitation, he is in essence saying, this new life cannot be business as usual, or trying to fit God as if one more task on an already too long list. Instead, it's an invitation to think and even reorient and becoming altogether different. In a sense, who and what we are comes down to how much we are willing to release. Can we allow ourselves to give up what possesses us? To have Christ as the center of our life, first and foremost. What are we willing to lose in order to gain Christ? And how are we truly prepared to live differently because of that encounter? This is our highest calling as disciples, and yet we are not asked to do it alone. We do it by what we share, what we explore, what we ask, how we grow and serve together in God's name. Amen. Let us affirm our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People are Form 6, found on page 392 in the Book of Common Prayer. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Wayne, our provisional bishop, Ken, Nettie, and Wendell, our assisting bishops, and all bishops, for Darren and Heather, our priests, and all the ministry of the baptized, for all who serve God in his church. We pray also for those whose needs are closely linked with ours, and for those who suffer from any sickness, grief, or distress, especially those on our parish prayer list. Dick, Dorsey, Jim, Josephine, Kay, Lily, Lisa, Mike, Scott, Sherilyn, Steve, Susan, the Vedral family, and all those affected by natural disasters and human tragedies, especially remembering the people of Ukraine at this time. We pray for the first responders and the aid and relief efforts that continue there and around the world, and especially for everyone affected by the coronavirus, as well as our own shut-in parishioners and their caregivers. I invite your own names and concerns offered either silently or aloud. We pray especially for peace in our homes and around the world, remembering those who have lost their homes and families to violence here or abroad, as well as those who serve and protect our own freedom especially Harrison, Matt, Becky, Jennifer, Steve, Philip, Perrin, and Tony, for their safety as well as the just use of the power that is placed in their hands. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Let us pray together for our Stephen ministry, saying, Risen Lord, you have commanded us to love one another and commissioned us to make disciples. Help us as we live into the fullness of your call to new life. Give us wisdom and clarity as we prayerfully consider your call to serve and seek the most effective ways to bring your healing love to those in need. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. I invite your own thanksgivings offered either silently or aloud. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, especially Lori, they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put your, their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
Almighty God, you have so linked our lives with one another that all we do affects, for good or ill, all other lives. So guide us in the work we do, that we may do it not for self alone, but for the common good. And as we seek a proper return for our own labor, make us mindful of the righteous aspirations of other workers, and arouse our concern for those who are out of work. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission, for forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace, and at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. 
Using the prayer adapted by our National Cathedral, a spiritual communion is a personal devotional that anyone can pray at any time to express their desire to receive Holy Communion at that moment, but in which circumstances impede them from actually receiving Holy Communion physically. As we share in communion in one way or another, let us pray. Beloved Jesus, I believe that you are present in the Blessed Sacrament of the altar. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Let me never be separated from you in this life or in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The wisdom of God, the love of God, and the grace of God strengthen you to be Christ's hands and heart in this world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and remain with you this day, this season, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.